So we've all heard about the trouble that consuming too much alcohol can create, and if somebody's having significant alcohol cravings, it can really create a lot of problems for the body, but also a lot of problems in their life. So the motivation is readily available to correct this issue, but doing so is not always so easy. Now there's a lot of very popular steps out there that can be very beneficial and have helped millions of people correct these problems. But in this video, I wanna help you understand some physiological issues that can be going on in the body that can really magnify these cravings and make it very difficult for a person to get past them. So in this video, I wanna break those issues down so that you can understand the possible issues that can be really making this a lot harder. And if you can learn how to work with your body instead of against it, then you can correct these issues and make the problem of getting past these cravings a lot easier and also make those very popular steps a whole lot more effective. Let's jump in. TC Hill is not a doctor and does not claim to be a doctor or licensed in any type of medical field. Don't be an idiot and use anything heard on the show as medical advice. This information should be used for educational purposes only and you should contact your doctor for any medical advice. Now get off me. So to understand these cravings, we really need to think about what is the body looking for? Or what is the person even looking for? A lot of people feel like when they drink, they kind of, they can relax, they can reduce stress, they can feel calm, and all of these things can be true. And in many cases, this can be about what the body is looking for. A lot of times the body doesn't have all the resources that it needs to function correctly. We kind of view it like, oh, I ate that Danish and that gave me enough energy to walk to my car and drive to work so I got what I needed. But the body needs a lot of nutrients to run all of the functions that it needs to run. And when it's missing those, it can create stress to the body. So we need to look at what would the body need and why would it be craving a specific substance. And one thing to think about is that alcohol, beyond the addictive properties that it can have within it, we want to look at the fact that it's a form of liquid sugars. And when liquid sugars go into the body, they go in a lot faster. They don't have to be broken down and turned into glucose. Those liquid sugars just go right in pretty quickly and can supply the brain with fuel very quickly. So in a lot of cases, when the body is really craving something, the brain is not getting the fuel or resources that it needs. And sometimes when it's not getting the resources like minerals and other nutrients that it needs, it can use sugars to kind of buffer those low resources. So it will remember, oh yeah, when you drank that, that fuel came right in and I had immediate fuel for the brain. Go ahead and get me some of that and we get these types of signals, hey, I really gotta have this stuff. So when we're looking at the need of what the body has for different types of nutrients, we wanna look at a person's ability to assimilate nutrients correctly because this will vary greatly from person to person. We talk so much about what diet is right, but if a person can't really break that diet down and assimilate the nutrients in that diet, they're not really getting the benefits from that diet, now are they? So a person's ability to get the nutrients out of the food that they're consuming is really gonna be different for every person. So one thing that we can look at is we can just look at our blood pressure. We can do this at home. You can pick up a blood pressure cuff for 30 or $40 at any pharmacy. And if you look at your blood pressure at least two hours after a meal, you don't wanna do it first thing in the morning when you're fasted, it should be after a meal, but at least two hours after, and if that systolic number, which is the top number, is below 112, that can be a really strong sign that there's not enough minerals and nutrients in the system. Now, this is not a diagnostic thing. You're just kind of getting a picture of how your body is operating. And if those minerals are really low, that can cause the body to say, hey, I'm not getting all the stuff I need. You need to give me something else so that I can run all the functions that I need to run. Now again, this blood pressure thing is not diagnostic because when we're looking at blood pressure, we're looking at a variety of aspects of what's in the system. We're kind of looking at minerals like we talked about, but also protein a little bit and glucose that can be in the blood, thickening up the blood, and even filth. If a body can't really detox correctly, filth can thicken up that blood and raise the pressure needed to push it through the system. So a person might have a normal blood pressure like 120 over 80 and say, oh, my blood pressure is okay, but if their blood sugar is really high or if they've trashed their liver drinking so much alcohol and the liver can't really detox the body correctly or other detox pathways are not working correctly, 
then that blood pressure could be showing all the filth or sugar in the system and maybe minerals and nutrients that the body really needs are still low. So don't just look at the blood pressure like, oh, I passed that test, so that must not be the problem. But if the blood pressure does come up low, that's a really strong indication that the body is really not getting all the nutrients that it needs, which can, which can lead to a variety of cravings, not just alcohol cravings. It can be sugar and other cravings as well. And so what we want to look at in a situation like that is we want to look, does the person deal with any type of digestive symptoms at all, like burping or bloating or constipation or diarrhea or acid reflux or nausea or even like indigestion or just skin or acne issues? All of these can be signs that digestion is not working correctly and the person can't get all the nutrients out of the food that they're eating. So when we look at this, when we eat food, our stomach should make hydrochloric acid or HCL, and that helps us acidify that food so we can start that breakdown process. The problem is it's very common today for people not to be making enough stomach acid for a wide variety of reasons. But once that food is acidified in the stomach, it should leave and come down here into the duodenum, and that's when the gallbladder should squirt this alkaline bile down to help neutralize those acids. And that alkaline bile meeting the acid substance that left the stomach, those opposite pHs colliding, creates this sizzle that really helps us bust the food apart and get all the nutrients out of that food. And that bile also helps us emulsify or break down our dietary fats and access fat-soluble vitamins like A, E, D, and K. So this is very important stuff. But it's very common for someone's bile to become too thick and sticky to flow correctly, and then it's not coming down. And those two opposite things are not meeting and really helping us bust our food apart. Now, there's other aspects of digestion that are important as well, but it's these two sides that are the really big players and that are very common for one or both of these issues to be malfunctioning with an individual. And if either of those is malfunctioning, they're not really getting all the nutrients that they're needing. The body is going to scream for other stuff. So this digestive symptoms becomes very important to correct any underlying causes of those symptoms. Now, if you want to understand how to do that, chapters three and four of my book, Kick Your Fat in the Nuts, kind of walk you through figuring out which aspects of digestion are not working correctly, and if so, what steps can you take to correct those? And the book is available on Amazon, but I'm going to put a link in this description below so you can get the whole thing totally for free. And then you can just jump to chapters three and four to figure out, is this a problem for me? Is my body not getting the nutrients that it needs? So of course it's going to scream for any type of fuel source that it can remember that has brought in quick fuel. My brain needs quick fuel. I got to know what's going on. I got to know how to process things. Give me some fuel. So if you can give the body what it really needs, all of a sudden those cravings can go way down, no matter what those cravings are. Step number two is to fix any hypoglycemic type issues. So for a lot of people, when they consume carbohydrates or sugars or starch or alcohol, like liquid sugars, their insulin can process that glucose almost like a bully, almost like too effectively. It can sweep too much glucose out of the bloodstream too quickly, and then we get that blood sugar crash. So when that blood sugar crashes, that's where the real trouble starts. We want to try and keep that blood sugar on an even keel so the body and the brain have access to the fuel that they're trying to access. So when we get that crash, people have a lot of trouble, and that's usually when cravings kick in in a big way. So one thing a person can do is they can reduce things like soda and sugars and junk carbohydrates that are really going to spike blood sugar, make a lot of insulin go high, and then really create that crash. For some people, it's because their insulin is working too effectively. And you can look at your urine pH a couple hours after a meal. You can pick up urinalysis pH testing strips at most health food stores. And you can just look at your urine pH, and if that's like 6.2, 6.3 or higher, that's a really strong sign that you may be processing those glucose too efficiently, too aggressively. Now this is again, not diagnostic. It's just something that we see very commonly. And it's very common too, if someone's having a lot of these sugars for that urine pH to show higher and for the body to say, oh, I gotta process these more effectively because this person keeps bringing in these huge amounts of carbohydrates. 
The thing is, when somebody tries to quit drinking and try to get rid of alcohol, they find themselves having a lot of soda, a lot of sugar, a lot of junk, because that's what the body's saying it needs. It's like, hey, I remember that this liquid stuff, that gave me fuel real quick. What other thing can you give me that's gonna give me immediate fuel? Oh, those Nilla wafers, I broke those down real quick. Give me those. That's soda, give me some of that. That worked just as well. So people start to crave these things, and that's also why we see, oh man, I quit drinking, but I gained 300 pounds, and now I'm a type two diabetic. So that didn't work out so great. We wanna to learn to work with the body instead of just replacing one problem with another problem. Now, doing this temporarily, maybe that is a better step for some people, but if you can figure out why the body's not really getting the things that it needs and help it get those things, then you don't have to go this route either. But this also helps us understand why we're starting to see success with some people using like a ketogenic diet or maybe a carnivore diet where they're pushing the body into ketosis and helping them get past cravings and some addictions and things like that because they're removing the sugar crashes. When you remove all that sugar that's coming in, you remove the spike and the crash. Remember, it's the crash where the trouble happens. So if a person is not eating any carbohydrates and they're putting the body into ketosis, they're not only giving the body these ketones that the brain can use for fuel, but they're removing the blood sugar crash and keeping their blood sugar on a more even keel where the body can just run a little bit more smoothly. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm saying that a ketogenic or a carnivore diet is the right step to take to try to get rid of alcohol cravings. I feel like for a lot of people, it's not because when you keep insulin that low, it can cause some people to pee out even more minerals. So when we look, talked about before this blood pressure thing, somebody's showing signs that the body already has more really low minerals and it's asking for more sugar and things to replace that, going on a ketogenic diet may cause some of those people to pee out even more minerals. So if you wanna look into that, we'll put a link in the description below for our video on who should not use a ketogenic diet to figure out if that might be right for you or what problems you might need to correct to make you qualify to use a ketogenic diet. Again, I don't think a person needs to use a ketogenic diet. If they can just remove these things that are spiking blood sugar in a big way, and then maybe include what we call more medium carb foods, where you're supplying the body with easy to access carbohydrates from real food sources, like sweet potatoes or yams or Brussels sprouts or butternut squash, these types of things are supplying the body with some carbohydrates and fuel that it might need without creating the huge spike and the huge crash that's going to come with that. Which can take us to step number three, which can be really small doses of fructose, like maybe just a little bit of fruit at a time. We see a lot of clients do well when they can't really process their food correctly yet. Maybe they're still improving digestive malfunctions and their minerals are really low for one reason or another they'll give themselves a really small dose of fruit, like those little cutie orange things that you just kind of peel with your hand that are really easy, or tangerines. They'll have just like two little wedges at a time. Just eat two wedges, not two cutie oranges. That can be too much sugar that can create a spike and a crash. But fructose seems to process a little bit differently than sugar, and if you do really small amounts at a time, it can give a person some fuel to get them through a tough spot. So I mean like, three blueberries or just two of these little cutie orange wedges where they're just maybe having that every couple hours or maybe if they're between meals and feeling like they're dipping down a little bit or starting to get some cravings, they can give this body this easy to access fuel source that'll get them through a tough spot. And for step number four and five, I wanna talk about some amino acid supplements that have been shown to be very beneficial. We'll put some links to some studies below that have shown that this can be very helpful in situations like this. And L-glutamine is an amino acid that you're gonna find in a lot of foods like proteins that you consume. You're getting glutamine likely on a daily basis. But there's a few reasons that glutamine can be beneficial. And one is that it has the ability to raise blood pressure a little bit. So if a person is having a lot of cravings because their blood pressure is really low, then glutamine has the ability to thicken up that blood a little bit, raise that blood pressure, and allow them to feel a little bit more like a human and function a little bit better. Now, there's some other things, glutamine converting to glutamate, and there's some other aspects that glutamine seems to have the ability to allow the body to produce its own sugar through gluconeogenesis and some other pathways so it can give the body some glucose without you bringing in those carbohydrates and spiking insulin levels so high and then creating that crash. 
So it seems to be a way to kind of give the person an even distribution of that glucose and allow them to reduce not only the cravings, but some of the withdrawal effects that can come from the crashes that come and from all that detoxification that needs to happen when a person really stops bringing in all of these toxins that are coming in so frequently. So there seems to be a variety of issues that can come from glutamine. And uh, the amino acid L-phenylalanine is very similar. And there's other studies that have shown this can be beneficial. But when we're looking at using glutamine and L-phenylalanine, L-flannel, flannel, flannel, flannelanine, it's kind of hard to say, you just say it however you want really, we need to understand how it can affect our body chemistry as well. And it was Dr. Emmanuel Rivisi who helped us understand that the body has a natural circadian rhythm at the cellular level. So during the day, the body should be in this catabolic state where it's very good at creating energy and keeping us going all day and breaking down tissues so that they can be rebuilt. So that's very appropriate. And then at night, the body should move into this anabolic state where the body's very good at sleeping and resting and rebuilding and repairing. So both of those states are appropriate. They're both good. The problem is a lot of people can get really stuck in one of these states most of the time, or maybe you just way too far into one of these states. And a person getting stuck in either of these states can really create a lot of symptoms and health issues, and some can be very significant. So when we're looking at these amino acids to help reduce these cravings, we need to understand that glutamine is a very pro-anabolic amino acid. So if a person is already really stuck over in that anabolic state and they're having a lot of symptoms like constipation or anxiety and other problems that can come from being stuck in that state and they started supplementing with glutamine, they could really magnify that imbalance and all the symptoms that are coming from it. Now this one, L-phenylalanine, that's a pro-catabolic amino acid. So that's gonna push a person in the other direction. But if a person's stuck in that catabolic state, they could really magnify that problem. So it's nice to understand, get an idea of where your body chemistry is to know which one might work best for you. Now there's a link to a study below where people were kind of using both of these at the same time and maybe that helped balance out and not create any trouble in either direction. But that book that I told you how to get for free, That'll also walk you through running simple self-tests that you can do at home using tools you can pick up at a pharmacy or a health food store to get an idea if you might be leaning too far in one of those states. Because one thing to think about is we're talking about trying to fix this hypoglycemic type issue. Well, being too far in that anabolic state has the ability to really magnify the body's hypoglycemic response when you're consuming any kind of carbohydrates or sugar. So a person could start taking glutamine and like, oh man, this is really helping my cravings. It's really doing great. But if they take it too long and push themselves too far into that anabolic state, it can start magnifying cravings by creating bigger sugar crashes. So it's really nice when you can, instead of just using a remedy that's popular and all the cool kids are using, you can use something that's appropriate for you and your body chemistry and really work with your body and see much better results that way. Now, the final thing that I wanna to touch on is just time. When you're trying to take steps to get rid of a craving, sometimes it's just about, I'm gonna white knuckle through this. If I can get to day eight, then a lot of people feel like they've come out of the woods a little bit. They've kind of turned a corner if they can make it eight days without any alcohol and the body starts to forget a little bit. Oh, I really want that. That makes that fuel really easily and it'll start to look to other sources and reduce those cravings a little bit. So sometimes it can be really difficult to get through those eight days, but once you can do that, then there's still maybe some struggle, but it can get a little bit easier. So again, this can be a difficult task, but if you can work with your body, you can make things a whole lot easier. And those other steps that are very popular can be very beneficial. I don't want you to think I'm saying not to do those steps. They can be very helpful. But a lot of times when we can fix the underlying cause of some malfunctions that are going on, it can make those steps a whole lot easier. But since that digestive action seems to be so important to your body's ability to bring in nutrients and assimilate those nutrients, then you can jump over right now to check out our video on 10 signs of low stomach acid and 10 signs of poor bile flow to see if any of those issues need attention and could make the whole process a whole lot easier for you. I can't wait to hear about your results.